The sermon you are about to hear is entitled, But Have Everlasting Life, by Dr. Curtis Hudson. This sermon was recorded on Sunday morning, February 23, 1975, at the Forest Hills Baptist Church in Decatur, Georgia. And now, here's Dr. Curtis Hudson. All right, if you have your Bible this morning, open them, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. I want to share with you this morning again, John 3, 16, and call your attention to the last expression in that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now let's bow our heads for prayer. And our Heavenly Father, we may as well not have been here today than to assemble and go away without the conscious awareness of thy presence. I know you live in our heart. I know the moment we receive Christ as our Savior, that you come in the person of the Holy Spirit. But I not only want you to be the resident, I want you to be the president in our own life this morning. I want you to be on the throne. I want to thank my thoughts after thee and say today exactly what you want me to say and say it in the exact manner in which you have me to say it. We do need thee. I pray for every person in the congregation. I pray they'll listen this morning very carefully. And I pray you'll help me to get across to the people the thought that's on my mind. I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. For several weeks now, I've spoken from John 3.16. I think I've told you every Sunday morning that it has been called the heart of the Bible. It has been called the gospel in a nutshell. The more I read the verse, the greater the verse seems to become. It begins with God, and it ends with everlasting life, And you are between the two, and the word whosoever. The verse tells two things about God and two things about man. It says about God that he loved and he gave. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It says about man that if he believes, he has. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want to confine my remarks today to the expression found in the last part of this verse, which speaks of the blessing of the saved. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Shall not perish gives the negative aspect, but have everlasting life gives the positive aspect. This little word, but, distinguishes between the saved and the lost. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It distinguishes between the justified and the guilty. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. It distinguishes between those who have life in Christ and those who are dead in trespasses and sin. The word everlasting and eternal are the two words used in the Bible to describe the life that the believer has. The two words, everlasting and eternal, are used synonymous in the Bible because they are different translations of one Greek word. So I'll use the word everlasting and eternal interchangeable in the sermon this morning. Now there are four things I want to say first. Everlasting life requires some distinction. As a boy, when I thought of everlasting life, I thought of eternal existence. But you must distinguish between everlasting life and eternal existence. They are not one and the same. If eternal existence were everlasting life, then Satan himself would have everlasting life because Satan will exist forever. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10 says, 
that he's cast into the lake of fire where the beast and false prophet are, and the smoke of their torment goes up day and night forever. If eternal existence means everlasting life, then the unsaved have everlasting life. Because in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, the unsaved are cast into the same lake of fire where the beast and false prophet are and where Satan is. And they're tormented day and night forever and ever. If everlasting life means eternal existence, then the demons have eternal existence and have thus have everlasting life. There were a group of angels, the Bible said, that kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, and God hath reserved them in everlasting chains of darkness under the judgment of the great day. They are still in existence. They will exist eternally. Matthew 25, 41 says, These shall go away into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So everlasting life does not mean eternal existence. 1 John 5, 11 says, God hath given to us eternal life. Eternal life belongs to the us mentioned in this text. God hath given to us. It does not refer to unbelievers, but it refers to believers. Only born-again believers have everlasting life. So life that lasts forever is not everlasting life. They are not one and the same. Second distinction I want to make is this. Everlasting life does not refer to the natural life. You do not have everlasting life by virtue of your birth. No education, no religion, no joining of organizations, no moral conduct, no character. Nothing you can do nor anyone can do for you can produce everlasting life. Thirdly, Everlasting life does not mean immortality. You might want to make a note of this. Immortality in the scriptures refers to the body. The living body is called in the Bible a mortal body. The dead body in the Bible is called a corruptible body. The living body is never called a corruptible body, nor is the dead body ever called a mortal body. And so when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it says this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality, there are terms that have to do with the resurrection and renovated bodies of the saints. This corruptible has to do with the resurrected body of the saints putting on an incorruptible And this mortal has to do with the living saints being changed from a mortal into immortality. Always it has to do with the body. It never has to do with anything other than the body. And then I want to make this distinction. Everlasting life does not mean heaven. We somehow get the idea that that this is one life we have now, and when we die, it'll be another life altogether. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Someday we're going to die and go to heaven and have everlasting life. We think when we die, we're going to everlasting life. But that's not true. We already have everlasting life. We're not dying and going to everlasting life. John 3, 36 said, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Not the promise of everlasting life. Not that you're going to die and go to everlasting life, but you already have everlasting life now. Now, I don't rule out heaven. Heaven is a real place, a place where we'll spend, and I don't like that expression, but it's the only one I know right now, 
a place where we'll spend part of our eternal or everlasting life, but I'm spending some of it here because I've had it since I was 11 years old. And then may I say that everlasting life is not a spark of divine life. You know, it sounds so good to hear the sociologists teach that man has any more spark of divine life and all it needs is a little a little puffing of social service to flame up and everything that man ought to be. Only one thing wrong with that, the divine spark went out 6,000 years ago and all man has now is the coal ashes. He's in the fallen image of Adam. He's lost. He has a sin nature. He's on his way to hell and there's nothing good in him. There's no spark of divine life there. And everlasting life is is not the old life changed. Something different altogether. Somehow we get the idea that God's given us a recipe book on how to do it, and if we follow this book, somehow we'll make out of this life everlasting life. That's not true. You can do everything you want to the flesh. You can polish it up and uh, repair it. Keep the Ten Commandments, be religious, join the church, read the Bible, pray, sing, give money, do all the other, but everlasting life is not the old life change. And so I hope you see that everlasting life needs an explanation. Jot the verses down. You worry me when you don't make notes. You won't remember everything I'm saying. 1 John 5, 20 said, This said, His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. In Colossians 3, 4, the Bible said, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, 2 Corinthians 4.10 says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. In Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And 1 John 5, 11 and 12 said, God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And I could quote many other verses, but I'll stop with these. Eternal life is not something given us from the Son, but it's something that's in the Son. A house may catch on fire and a spark may be blown by the wind over to another house and that house may catch on fire. But Christ did not throw off a divine spark of life that landed on us. There is no life, eternal life, apart from Christ God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. You ever read that parable, not the parable? Yes, I guess it is a parable in a sense. In John chapter 15, the vine and the branches, where Jesus walked with the vineyard and talking to his disciples, he said, I am the true vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, the same bringeth forth fruit. He that abideth not in me, the same withereth and is cut off and bundled up and cast into the fire. You ever read that? Did you ever go to a vineyard? Did you ever notice a vine and branches? Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. The life in the branch is no different than the life in the vine. It's the same life. It is not one life in the vine and another life in the branch. It's the same life. And the only life the branch enjoys, it enjoys by virtue of the fact 
that it's in union with the vine. Can you see the sap coming up through the vine, going out into the branches? It's the same life. Same life. Same life in the branches it is in the vine. Derived by virtue of the fact that it's in the vine. If I get this truth across to you, you wouldn't be the same anymore. You don't possess a life that Christ has given to you apart from his own life. The life that you possess as a born-again believer is the same life that Jesus Christ possesses. He's no more alive than you are. He has no more life than you have because you have his life. That's what Paul said. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life of the flesh is in the blood, Leviticus 17:11. Did you know that your heart lives in every part of your body? Every time your heart beats, you can feel it in your wrist. Every time your heart beats, you can feel it in your head. Every time your heart beats, you can feel it in your ankle. And every part of your body, when your heart beats, it causes a pulse in every member of your body. So that my foot might say, I live. Nevertheless, not I, but the heart liveth in me. And my hand might say, I live, nevertheless, not I, but the heart liveth in me. The same thing Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless, I live, and yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If I could somehow get across to you, and most of us are waiting to die. Most Christians are waiting, thinking death's going to make some big, gigantic, miraculous change, and, and we're going to have a quality of life after death we do not now have. But that's not true. You have the same life after death that you have now. You're not going to eternity. If you have eternal life, you're already in eternity. I've been in eternity since I was 11 years old. I'm not going to eternity. I'm in eternity now. Oh, that's enough to make a Presbyterian child, isn't it? I mean, now with my receding hairline and my bridges and my bulges and my bunions and my bifocals. I'm in eternity now. I have eternal life. I used to think, you know, I just got to sort of put up with this down here and it's, Something you sort of endure and, and you're sort of hoping someday you'll move out and move in to eternal life, but already have it. If I get that truth across to you, you have it now. You already are in eternity. And you ought to be living now as if you was already in heaven. If ye then be risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Father. Colossians chapter 3. You ought to be living now like you already are in heaven, because in reality you are a citizen of heaven. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior. I'm already a citizen of heaven. Now! About the only thing going to happen when I die is, is I'm going to move into a temporary body, but it's going to be the same life. I'll await the resurrection of this body when Jesus comes, and it'll be made like unto the Lord's own glorious body, the resurrection, and it's corruptible. If I die, we'll put on incorruption. And if I'm living when Jesus comes, it's mortal, we'll put on immortality. Well, the truth of the matter is, the life part won't change at all. It's the same life. A.B. Simpson once said, The highest expression of Christian living is not an imitation of Christ, but rather a repetition of Christ. 
I want to say that again. The highest expression of Christian living is not an imitation of Christ, but rather a repetition of Christ. And isn't that what Paul said in Galatians 2.20? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, and yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and every Christian ought to be a reincarnation of Jesus Christ. You say, hmm, yeah, but true. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And he went away and said, now you're the light of the world. You occupy in my stead. You're the light for I was the light. You're in my stead. You occupy in my stead. We pray, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. 1 John 5, 12. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. Eternal life then is Christ. He is our life. I'm the resurrection of the life. And the fellow who has eternal life is the fellow who has Christ. Christ living in you. So that you could say like Paul, I'm crucified with the Christ, nevertheless I live, and yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He that hath the Son hath life. Not he that has religion, not he that has baptism, not he that has church membership, but he that has the Son. The fellow who has received Jesus Christ as his Savior has life, and the fellow who has not the Son hath not life. And I think I could paraphrase a lot of expression there. He who will not have the Son will not have life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. He says, I won't have him. I've got my own religion. I'm satisfied with my own religion. The lady said recently as I knocked on the door, I'm Curtis Hudson from Forest Hills Baptist Church. Oh, we have our own religion. And you need not waste your time with us. We have our own religion. Well, that's nice. And we're satisfied with our own religion. I said, lady, the question is not, are you satisfied with your religion? But the question is, is God Almighty satisfied with your religion? You're going to stand before God someday. You'll answer to God someday. Is he satisfied with it? God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If I wanted to give you something, don't you think I'd have the right to wrap it up in any kind of box I wanted to? If I gave you a new watch for Christmas, I could wrap it up just like I please. I'm giving it to you. Well, God purposes to give everlasting or eternal life, and he has the right to wrap it up like he wants to. And he wrapped it up in his son, Jesus. And you can't have eternal life apart from Jesus. No matter how sincere you are in your religion, no matter how hard, how hard you try to live right, if you reject Jesus Christ, you go to hell when you die. Life is a gift. There is no spontaneous generation. Life comes only from life. From nothing, nothing can come. You take a bottle and create a perfect vacuum, seal it off, leave it there 10 billion trillion years, when you open it, you'll have nothing in it because there was nothing in it. From nothing, nothing can come. Life comes from life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. God gives it, and he gives it in his Son. I think I'll probably preach my third point out of my second one, but let me say this. Everlasting life declares present possession. God hath given to us. Not something he's going to give. He's given it. It's ours already. The scriptures do not draw a contrast between the here and there. Nor do they draw a contrast between the now and then. But the scriptures draw a contrast between the seen and unseen. But the unseen is just as real as the seen. While we look not at things which are seen, are not seen, for the things which are seen are temple and so on. The distinction is between the seen and the unseen, but the unseen is just as real. Heaven is just as real as earth. Angels are just as real as humans. 
The difference is seen and unseen. We have eternal life now. And we ought to be living it now. I go back to the text. Galatians 2.20 For I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, and yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Now that's Paul talking. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Christ is living now in me. It included his everyday life. He's talking about Christ living in him while he's making tents with Priscilla and Aquila. He's talking about Christ living with him, in him, while he goes down to the shops to buy material, to make tents. Christ living while I go down to the shop. He's talking about Christ living in him in his private life. When he visits the marketplaces. When he's eating. When he's drinking. When he's sleeping. When he's out visiting. When he's having uh, social uh, visits. He's talking about Jesus living every day of his life. Not something he's going to do someday in the sweet by and by. Old Sam Jones, a Methodist evangelist, buried at Carterville, used to say, we ought to quit singing about the sweet by and by until we clean up the nasty hearing now. And I do think there's too much emphasis on the sweet by and by. You know, someday we're going to die and go to heaven and it's going to be all right then. It ought to be all right now. We ought to be manifesting Christ now. The Christian life is not an imitation of the Christ life, regardless of Thomas Kempis' little book. I've read it, and it has some sweet sayings in it, and I've quoted him. But the Christian life is not an imitation of the Christ life. The Christian life is Jesus living his life all over again in you. You say, I, I just can't live up to it. I've tried, I've tried, and God knows I've tried, but I, I fail. Well, give it your best. God will do the rest. There's a legend told somewhat illustrates what I'm trying to say. It's a far from perfect illustration. On one occasion in the latter days of Greece, all practical faith in the gods had died out of the minds of the educated people. And so some sculptors got together and offered a prize to the sculptor who would make the best statue of a certain God. By a marble quarry lived a little country lad who happened to still believe in that particular God. And for love of that God, he desired to make the statue. So he got him a piece of marble. And he chipped away at the marble the best he could. It was rough looking. Far from beautiful. And when he told of his stature, and the experts came to see it, they all laughed. They laughed at his stature. It was awful looking. It looked like anything but the God that he was trying to build a statue of. But the legend goes on to say that the God that the boy loved so much that he tried to make a statue like him, looked down and saw the others laughing. And the God entered into the statue. And suddenly it took on smooth lines and erected its head and held its head up high and became the most beautiful statue. I think when we give our best, and God knows we want to do, and there's a hunger in our heart to be like Christ, and we go to bed at night and say, I failed again, Lord. I really wanted to be like you today, but I, I, I slipped again. I really wanted to. And we weep over our failures. I think God sees our failures. And I think God comes to the rescue. I'm not suggesting that, like the legend of the God, he comes into the statue, but in a sense he does. And that's what Paul says. I'm living. I'm living by faith. In the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The God himself entered that pathetic marble figure. Then, everlasting life includes eternity. I mentioned earlier that 
Eternal existence is not everlasting life, but it certainly includes eternity. You'll die. If Jesus doesn't come, we'll all die. But there is a real, real place called heaven. I know folks say, well, it's a figment of the imagination. It's a state of the mind. It's good for uh, uneducated folks to think about it. It sort of helps them through life. It's a good crutch. Huh. No, it's a place. John fourteen six, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me and my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a state of the mind for you. And if I go and prepare a state of the mind for you, I'll receive you unto myself, that you and I both might be in the same state of the mind. No, no, no. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. It's a place. And he said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures where moths and thieves do corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor thief doth corrupt. You can't corrupt the state of the mind. That can all be spoken of a place. Heaven is just as real as Decatur, Georgia. You say, well, what does it look like? Well, I've never been there. And the only fellow that did go there was told not to tell about it when he came back. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the first three verses. But I know something of what it looks like. The Bible describes it in Revelation chapter 21, 22. Describes it, the, the size of it in cubits. If you break the cubits down into miles... It's 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles tall. has streets that are made out of pure gold. Gold refined so pure that you can see through it. It's like transparent glass. Earth has no way of refining gold that pure. man this week was showing me a little bag of rings, diamond rings. He was trying to sell them. And I looked at the gold, and I said, Earth has no way of refining gold like heaven does. When heaven refines gold, you can see through it like glass. It makes the band look like the diamond. It has twelve gates, three on the east, north, west, and south, and every several gate is one solid pearl. It has foundations garnished with all manner of precious stones. It doesn't have any light there. It won't be any power failures. It won't be any energy shortages. Won't be any increase in the in your power bill. <clears throat> Has life there, but doesn't have a sun and moon. Says it doesn't need the sun and the moon for the Lamb is the light of the city. Christ is the light of it. It's heaven. You say, where is it? Well, it comes down from God out of heaven, but it doesn't say how far it comes. This is Hudsonology here. It comes down from God. I think it stops before it gets to the earth. I think it's suspended between heaven and earth like a big chandelier. Because the Bible said the nations of the earth shall walk in the light of it. And if it lights the whole earth where the sun now lights the earth, it'll have to be suspended up here, a big bright thing like the sun. It's a beautiful place. And the life you have now, when you die, you just move there. And I won't preach on the whole thing, but the Bible said to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. And the Bible said the Lord is now seated on the right hand of the Father in heaven. Everlasting life includes eternity. Count the gold and silver blossoms, spring that's scattered over the leaf. Count the softly sounding ripples sparkling on the summer sea. Count the lightly flickering shadows in the autumn forest glade. Count the pale, count pale natures, scattered teardrops, icy gems of winter made. Count the tiny blades that glisten early in the morning dew. Count the desert sand that stretches under noontide's doom of blue. Count the notes that wood birds warble in the evening's fading light. Count the stars that gleam and twinkle o'er the firmament of night. When thy counting all is done, scarce eternity is begun. Be to pause, where wilt thou be during thine eternity? Billy Sunday tried to describe eternity once. <laughs> and 
And in his own way, old Billy Sunday said, If on yonder planet there was a little bird, and he flew thousands and thousands and thousands of miles to this planet here, it took him billions of years to make the trip. He picked up one grain of sand from the earth and flew for billions of years back to yonder planet and deposited the grain of sand. And the bird boo flew back for millions and millions of years and picked up another grain of sand and moved to yonder planet. Billy Sunday said when that little bird would have moved the entire earth to yonder planet, it would still be breakfast time in glory. You know, if you die and go to heaven today and say to Paul, Paul, how, how long you been here? He'd say, I got here today. You'd say, what? Today? You die and go to heaven and say to Polycarp the martyr, Polycarp, how long you been here? He said, I got here today. Just came this morning. <laughs> what? Yeah. Stephen Stone, the book of Acts. Stephen... How long have you been here? I said, I just arrived this morning. Well, where'd you get that out of the Bible? Not but one day. Just one long day. Everybody has to get that same day. Come on. Because there's no night there. No night there. Our finite minds cannot grasp it. Eternity. I quote the text. I'll be through. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, have everlasting life. That's the promise. If you put your faith in Jesus, you will have everlasting life. You will have it. If you don't have it, God's a liar. And Hebrews 6, 18 says, God cannot lie. Will you trust him? Will you trust him and will you do it now, today? God bless you. Let's stand together, please. We pray you have been blessed by the message you've just heard. The Sword of the Lord has many helpful materials available for purchase. For a free catalog, please call 1-800-251-4100. Or you may reach us on the web at swordofthelord.com. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you.